Hey everyone, it's Miss Queen Crypto, and I am back again with another episode of Friday Block Talk here on the Emily channel. Now, in case you missed my last video, we're still not doing super hot on the market. However, the road to recovery is not for the faint of heart. So I'm not going to dwell on that for too much longer on my videos unless something crazy or catastrophic happens. But today I thought that this was a good opportunity to kind of go into some basics when we're talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So I wanted to do a blockchain breakdown for you guys and kind of go into the inception of the blockchain and kind of the early critiques of it and then the applications that we have for blockchain technology now and future technologies that people are proposing. So with that, let's get into it. A good place to start this conversation is to discuss what the blockchain actually is and how it differs from a typical database. So a blockchain is a type of database, a database being something where data is stored and organized in some way that makes it easier to look at than just pure raw data with no rhyme or reason. So a database usually structures its data into tables. However, a blockchain, given by the name, you're stored in blocks. So you have chunks of data that are organized chronologically, which means time-based. So you have two transactions that occur at the same time or like a second apart, likely they'll be stored in the same block. With a database, that might not be the case. You can obviously have chronologically ordered databases, but that is not a key element of a database. However, that is a key element of a blockchain. And so you have your chronologically ordered blocks. However, something that's very special about the blockchain is once you publish a block, once you like close it off and no new data is going to be entering that block, it's not able to be edited. So once that block is published, you move on to the next one. And this one up here is basically set in stone. There's nothing that you can do to change the data that's in that block. And you can only continue to move forward. So this is obviously very appealing because it allows you to put have trust in the system and verification in the system without needing external parties to kind of say yes or no or to verify it themselves it's the the blockchain is self verifying in a sense and so you're basically just building on top of another and you don't have to worry about things getting lost and you can trace it all the way to the top so like for bitcoin for example the first block ever mined is called the genesis block i have a genesis block sweatshirt but then after that after that genesis block was published on the ledger, which is what we call like kind of the timeline. If you were to use the chronological kind of metaphor, the blocks are like a timeline and you can follow the timeline. Oldest blocks or the highest up blocks, if we were to look at like a visual example, are at the top and then the newest ones at the bottom. And so you kind of have a table that you can follow rather than with a database there's not necessarily a chronological order to it and that data can be edited after the fact. While Bitcoin is often accredited with the popularization of the blockchain and blockchain technology, the actual concept of a blockchain was published 17 years before the white paper for Bitcoin was, which is pretty crazy. It was published in an academic paper by Stuart Haber and W. Scott Stornetta and they were discussing ways to verify documents. So kind of like how you notarize data or notarize documents. Like if you've ever gotten something notarized and you know they have to write it in that little book and they have to stamp it to say, yep, they were trying to find a way to do that online so you wouldn't have to go to a notary. That was kind of like the basic premise behind what they were discussing. But they actually met a lot of criticism in 1991 when this paper was published because people were saying that there weren't really any cases where this would be an effective use of technology and power or it wouldn't be efficient and that the current system was just as efficient. But they were talking about like registering intellectual property or proving that documents existed at a certain point in time. However, it wasn't until the Bitcoin white paper was published in 2008 that blockchain technology was really recognized as something innovative and that people were actually excited about. So is the Bitcoin blockchain just a copy and paste version of the 1991 research paper that actually invented this technology? Well, not exactly. 
If you go back and read the white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto actually references this paper multiple times in the white paper, which is pretty cool in case you want to go back and read it again. But Satoshi built on the framework that was set forth and like published by these, these researchers, and he added two key elements that really helped shape Bitcoin into what it is today, and that was both incentives and proof of work. So the incentives being the block reward that you get if you are the first to like solve the puzzle and publish the block and like verify it and proof of work being that you have multiple people checking and making sure that there is consensus before that block is published because since it is a decentralized blockchain you don't want someone who has ill will or someone who has malicious intent being able to come in and totally mess with the blockchain so illicit blocks are being put on the blockchain since like we said before you can't edit it once it's on the blockchain so you want to make sure that what is being published on that ledger is accurate and is a true measure of what has happened otherwise you can run into re some really serious trouble so with those two key element changes satoshi set up a really good framework for checking human will and making sure that it is more effective and it is in the user's best interest to comply with the system and to do what is best for the greater good and any selfish intent to try and change the blockchain or to manipulate it to your will would actually be against your favor. So playing to human nature with that one, which when I originally read the white paper, I was absolutely blown away with. I thought that was the craziest thing and I thought that it was so well thought out and so smart. So at one point when there were claims that the blockchain couldn't be used for anything that would actually be an effective use of energy, now people are saying that the only useful application for blockchain technology is finances in a setting like Bitcoin. However, saying that there are no other options or there is no other case where this would be effective doesn't sound like a great argument. So I think it's a great idea to kind of look into where blockchain technology might go from here. And a really exciting example is NFTs and the popularization of NFTs. So I think anyone who has ever learned anything about crypto, if you were to ask one person something crypto related, they, it would be about NFTs. Most people know about NFTs. That's one of the most mainstream elements of crypto, something that people can kind of get excited about because it makes it a little bit more accessible bringing art and visual elements to it. So NFTs right now are stored on a blockchain. Ethereum is running into problems with that because it's a lot to store on a blockchain. The data for an image is a lot more than the data for a transaction, but that's another conversation to have, not what we're talking about today. But people are saying that this could be really exciting for selling things like sports tickets and selling things like memberships because there's only a certain amount that you can have so coining them and you're basically minting them and you're able to sell and make sure that there are no like fake tickets out there people are saying that that's not a great solution to these problems and that this isn't really an effective solution it doesn't really do much however time's gonna tell with that one we can't really say now another industry where people are talking about bringing up the blockchain is with real estate and like land deeds so you could see exactly who owns what and when it was sold which is pretty similar to the current system minus the block part but when you look up like land ownership and you can look up tax records you can see the ownership history of a house so i can see how that would be an easy comparison to draw into and to kind of gauge whether or not it's actually applicable. One that I read up about a while ago but has not gained much traction was medical records being stored on the blockchain and I'm very glad that that one died down because that brings us into a lot of like possible violations for people's privacy which is something that Bitcoin is meant to protect. So I think that that could be something that's a little bit hairy and I'm glad that that's not something that's being forced onto us super hard, but it'll be very, very interesting to see how blockchain technology changes in like the next decade and how it might be integrated into our lives in ways that we might not even really notice. So 
it'll be definitely something I'm excited to watch happen the next couple of years, just like anything crypto related. We're still in early stages and so, so much can happen. I think that's a great place to leave it off, looking into the future and seeing what's going to happen. But thank you so, so much for sticking around to the end and watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave it a like and subscribe to the Embly channel if you're not already. And then if you want to see more content from me, follow me on Twitter at Miss Queen Crypto. I'd love to have you over there. But thank you so, so much again, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!